in case anyone else wants to hear my lame jokes. All right. A big city lawyer went duck hunting in rural Tennessee. He shot and dropped a bird, but it fell into a farmer's field on the other side of a fence. As the lawyer climbed over the fence, an elderly farmer drove up on his tractor and asked what he was doing. The litigator responded, I shot a duck and it fell in this field, and now I'm going to retrieve it. The old farmer replied, this is my property and you're not coming over here. The indignant lawyer said, I'm one of the best trial attorneys in the United States, and if you don't let me get that duck, I'll sue you and take everything you own. The old farmer smiled and said, apparently, you don't know how we settle disputes in Tennessee. We settle small disagreements like this with the three kick rule. The lawyer asked, what's the three kick rule? The farmer replied, well, because the dispute occurs on my land, first, I kick you three times, then you kick me three times, and so on back and forth until someone gives up. The attorney, the attorney quickly thought about the proposed contest and decided that he could easily take on the old man. He agreed to abide by the local custom. The old farmer slowly climbed down from the tractor and walked up to the attorney. His first kick planted the toe of his heavy steel toed boot right in the lawyer's groin. The next one to his gut, the next one to his face, kicking him right into a fresh cow pie. The lawyer summoned every bit of his will and managed to get to his feet. Wiping his face with the arm of his jacket, he said, all right, now it's my turn. The old farmer smiled and said, nah, I give up. You can have the duck. All right. Um, okay, so for our spiritual thought today, um, Elder Ulysses Suwadis in our most recent general conference said this, my dear friends, when we, when we resist the little temptations, which often come unexpected, unexpectedly in our lives, we are better equipped to avoid serious transgressions. As President Spencer W. Kimball said, seldom does one enter into deeper transgression without first yielding to lesser ones, which open the door to the greater. A clean field does not suddenly become weedy. While preparing to accomplish his design, divine mission on earth, the Savior Jesus Christ exemplified the importance of constantly resisting everything that might dissuade us from realizing our eternal purpose. After several unsuccessful attacks by the enemy who attempted to divert him from his mission, the Savior categorically dismissed the devil by saying, get thee hence, Satan. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Later in his talk, he said, I know that by following Jesus Christ, by following Jesus' example, we will avoid many tragedies and undesirable behaviors that might cause family problems and disagreements, negative emotions and inclinations, perpetrating injustices and abuses, enslavement by evil addictions, and anything else that would be against the Lord's commandments. This last weekend, my wife and I were talking about a family member who, who's been struggling recently. And we were reminded of uh, President, Uchtdorf, President Uchtdorf's talk that he gave a few years ago uh, about being one single degree off and um, how you'll end up in a completely different place if you're just one degree off than, than what you'd planned on. And uh, it really is the little things. We always hear that by small and simple things are great things brought to pass. And uh, it, it holds true in pretty much every facet of our lives. And so uh, as, as my wife and I talked, this, this reaffirmed the need that we have to constantly evaluate uh, our daily lives and our daily choices. Uh, from little things like what we choose to watch on Netflix to, uh, to, to everything, to everything in our lives. And so uh, I would also invite you guys to do the same as you guys think about your daily lives and you evaluate how you're doing, what you're feeling, what's going on. Um, think about our Savior's example, who, who chose to avoid every single thing that would take him off the path, any amount. So, all right, Carolyn, go ahead. Our Father in heaven, we are so grateful to thee for all that thou has given us. We're so grateful for this opportunity we have to learn, to further our education. We are grateful for our teacher, Brother Birch, and for the time that he gives us to help us answer our questions and help us to understand. We pray that thy spirit may be with us here as we have this classroom meeting, that we can um, have our minds open and receptive to all that we are talking about. And we pray these things in the name of thy son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Carolyn. All right. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen real quick. All right, and double check, we are recording. Okay, so guys, congrats. Congrats on making it like halfway through the semester. It's a big deal. Um, 
this morning I was talking with my wife about uh, Thanksgiving plans. We're like, are we going to go visit family or not? And then we talked about Christmas. And then I realized that I didn't want to come to work today. So, so I got to stay focused on the present. Um, but it's just, it's crazy how fast this semester is going by. Uh, okay, before we go into week eight and repetition, do you guys have any questions on week seven? On any of the assignments, any of the stuff from the book, anything that you guys wanted to talk about? I did have a question um, for the, um, was it the alarm assignment? Or the, oh man, no, it was the discount. Cause the discount was with different days, right? Uh, I don't remember. Oh, great, yeah. sorry. Okay. Okay, so one of them, I had a hard time checking if my function worked for different days. It was it was a discount one, I believe. Um, you showed us how to check it like when it was um, like, you know, like a Monday or a Wednesday. Um, but the one where it had to get the date, maybe it was the alarm where it had to get the date and then it told you whether to get up or not. I'm pretty sure it was actually the alarm. I, I couldn't figure out how to like check it for different days. All right. Okay. Defining table input none. We're going to use the computer's clock. We're going to get the date. Check if the date is equal to one of the following days. Check if it's a weekday or not. Create a message for the user that they can either sleep in or get up. And then we'll output that message. Okay, so here's my code. Uh, usually I don't go through my code just because I made videos on them. And so if anyone wants to go through my code, they always can. Uh, but this should be really similar to what I did in my video um, a few semesters ago. So right here, here's my logic for checking these different days. Okay, first I check for the new year, 4th of July, Christmas, and then I check to see um, if it's a weekday or not. And uh, then I have that message based on this sleep in Boolean value. Now, for testing this in different ways. So we're looking at two different things here. Uh, we're looking at today's, we're looking at the day of the month and the day of the week, okay? Day of the month to see, and month, uh, to see if we're on a holiday, okay? It doesn't matter if it's the 4th of February. Uh, it matters if it's like the 4th of January. And so right here, I'm saying if month is equal to zero, which is January, and the day is equal to one, which is the first, then that'll be new year and we'll say sleep in. Uh, now, if I wanted to change this, there, there's a really simple way that I can do this. Uh, and I'll show you guys two quick ways. First is, let's say I wanted to change any of these things. Okay, uh, I would just hit control C and control V. I'll hit enter and control V. And I'll just comment these out for a sec. Uh, I did that by selecting this and hitting control forward slash our question mark key. Igor, it might be different for your keyboard. Um, but then right here, I can say, okay, our month is, I'm going to force it to be July and I'm going to force the date, whoops. Uh, I'm going to force the day to be the fourth and I'll force the month to be July. Okay. Um, and then I could take this out for now. So right now, uh, when I'm going through and testing this, I want to test, I'll actually probably have to leave that in case day of week is used anywhere. Um, but right now I'm testing to see if it'll actually have me sleep in on July 4th. Okay. So I would copy my path, go over to my browser, whoops, go over to my browser, paste it. And I was open my developer tools, so I have them. Uh, I'm gonna hit sleep in and it says sleep in. Now, obviously Monday, November 2nd, I would not sleep in, uh, but it looks like it's working for July 4th. Okay, then I'll come back in here and be like, okay, uh, let's say the month is zero, so January and the day is first. Uh, let's see what happens. I can see that it did update that. And I'm going to put a breakpoint here so we can watch this this time. You can see day of month is zero, month is one. We don't care about the day of the week right now. Uh, the day of the week is the last thing I check. Okay. Um, but right here, uh, month is equal to, whoops. Okay. So right now I'm saying that this is the zero with day of February. And so let's, it says get up apparently we have to get up on that day. If I swapped that and I said the month is zero for January and the day of the month is the first, hit refresh, sleep in. Now these are right, the first of January. And then it checks this. It's like, okay, is this true? Whoops. If I highlight this one chunk, is this true? Yes. Is this true? Yes. Are both of them true together with that and in the middle? Yes. And it says sleep in and then it skips the rest. 
Okay. And so that's probably the easiest way to test it is once you have this code good to go um, and your application's working and you think that it's good, uh, just comp them out for a few minutes and test all of your different scenarios. Test the new year, test the fourth, test Christmas, and then test the day of the week. Okay. Uh, to test the day of the week, I would just, I'd probably just take these two out again. And then I would uncomment this. I can delete that because it's, well, I'll leave that actually. Um, but then day of the week uh, will be zero through six. And again, if, if you're forgetting, you're like, man, is Sunday, the, is Sunday one or is Monday one or is Sunday zero? If you don't remember, then just run it. Okay. So if I put my breakpoint right here and I hit my button, then I can see today's date is we have this huge date object. It's got all sorts of stuff in it. Okay. And get day, the get day function is a function that's built into our date object um, that we made when we said new date. Okay, so get day, and then I can see what this is gonna return. If I, if I highlight this whole thing, it's one. And I think about it, I was like, well, today's Monday. So I would assume that Sunday is zero, but I could always look at the documentation. I could, I could Google um, JavaScript date and, and see what get day returns. And so, and then I could test it. I'd be like, well, if Monday's one, then it'd be Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So six and seven, we're gonna we're gonna sleep in on. Um, but seven obviously isn't gonna work. It'll never return seven, and that would help. Uh, I would I would realize that if if I actually read about the get day function just in W three schools, it'll tell you that that it goes from zero to six. Same with the months, it goes from zero to eleven. So uh, I know that was a really long answer, Shara, but did that help? Yeah, that actually helps a lot. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, sweet. Any other questions, you guys? Okay, well, let's dive right into repetition. Uh, I love repetition. This is going to be an awesome, an awesome week for you because you can do some really, really, really powerful stuff with repetition. Sammy, was that a question? We got in the chat. Oh, in the chat. In the chat. There we go. Okay. Oh, Igor, did you have a different question that you wanted to ask? I'm in no rush. I think we can get through this material in 45 minutes. So, okay. Okay. You can ask after. after. All right. Glance at repetition. Uh, it allows us to execute the same code multiple times. Similar to an if statement, it always includes a Boolean condition. Now, when I say Boolean condition, if I look at code here, this is a Boolean condition. Okay. Even just one of these would be a Boolean condition, meaning that either month is equal to zero or it's not. Okay, it's going to return true or false. Um, and so all of these, anytime I have an if statement, anytime I have an else if statement, there will always be a Boolean condition in there. Now, uh, it's very likely that I have a variable that in and of itself is a Boolean condition. Sleep in is a Boolean variable. And so I could put that in here for, for my single condition. Okay, but no matter what, anytime I have an if statement, it will always have, ooh, like down here. Okay, it will always have a Boolean expression or condition. Uh, that is exactly the same with rep with repetition. Uh, in JavaScript, while and for loops are extremely common. Uh, Pre-test loops are super duper common. Post-test loops are not as common. We'll look at both today, uh, but like, like you see here, you'll use pre-test loops 99% of the time. Uh, controlling loops, uh, we have a couple of different kinds. We have counting loops and we have sentinel controlled loops. These are both common and it's important to learn both. So uh, the repetition control structure, we have talked about control structures before. Do you guys remember what a control structure is? That's okay. It might've been on a test. Maybe it'll be on your next test. I think it's on one of your tests. Um, a control, the control structures basically decide how the code gets executed. The default control structure is just top to bottom, left to right, kind of like how you read a book. But then there are things that mess with that, okay? If we have a function call, if we have an if statement, if I look back at this code right here, uh, once this function gets called, then I'll just go in here, top to bottom, we just come down, 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 down. And then right here, our if statement's gonna throw off that default top to bottom structure that we have. Okay, if this is true, it'll go here, and then it'll jump down to here. Okay, um, 
repetition, our while for, for each, and do while loops, these are all um, different types of loops that will also modify, modify that default top to bottom control structure. So let's look at an example. Use a while loop when you're using simple counting uh, and can't count and must use a sentinel controlled loop. The sentinel must be checked before executing the statements inside the loop. So let's look at these examples. Right here, uh, int x equals zero, while x is less than five. Notice our Boolean expression. Okay, it'll just check. In this case, the first time it runs, it'll say, is zero less than five? If it returns true, then we will execute everything inside of these curly braces. Very similar to with an if statement. Now, the only difference is with an if statement, uh, once this code gets executed, then it jumps to the bottom, right? Once this code gets executed, it'll jump back up to the while statement right here. And it will check this condition again. It'll say, hey, is x less than five? So if we look at this code right here, we say int x equals zero. And it says, while zero is less than five, true. We'll execute this alert. It will, it will alert zero. And then zero plus plus, what will that do? Yeah, I, I read your mouse, Shara. But yes, it'll increment it by one, OK? And uh, so yeah, so x would get bumped up to one. We hit this curly brace, and then it jumps back up to this Boolean expression. I'll say, is one less than five? Yes. Alert one x plus plus, x is now two, jump up. Is two less than five? Yes. And it'll keep going. And then once it's four, it'll alert four. Four plus plus, x will go up to five and it'll go up. Is five less than five? No. And then it will jump to the next line of code, which isn't here, okay? But so it's really similar to the, to the if statement. It'll execute the block of code inside the curly braces if the Boolean expression is true. Uh, but with loops, it jumps back up and it checks that Boolean expression again, which is really cool. All right, sentinel control loops. Int x equals zero, var sum equals zero. Wow, that's funny. Uh, ign ignore the int x stuff right here. I, sh I should fix that. Um, that is actually an invalid way to declare a variable in JavaScript. Uh, var is valid. You can see that, it, that it's a nice light blue color there. So we'll imagine this says var, var x equals zero, var sum equals zero. And notice right here that it says while sum is less than five and it says sum plus equals x and then x plus plus. The only thing that really changed here is in our while loop, instead of saying while x is less than five, we're now saying while sum is less than five. X is still getting incremented by one. So we call this a sentinel controlled loop because the number that we are directly modifying every time, incrementing by one, x, is not what's deciding, it's not in the Boolean expression for our while loop. And so because it's sum, sum will continue to be modified, but I will have to think about this a little bit to see how many times this is actually gonna happen. With the first line of code, it's like, oh, it'll go from zero to four, five is not less than five, so it'll execute five times. It's really easy to see that. With this one, I'd have to do a little bit of math and be like, okay, zero plus zero is zero. One plus zero is one. Two plus one is three. Three plus three is six. You know, I'd, I'd have to think through it a little bit. So this is an example of a sentinel controlled loop. Uh, let's see, let's actually run this real quick. I wonder if I have this somewhere. Okay, good, that's chapter seven. Chapter eight. Hmm. I don't think I have it here. Uh, let's go ahead and write this up real quick. So I'm just going to make a new file right here. And I'm just going to call this lecture uh, sentinel example. Sentinel. Null example. Okay, sorry guys. All right, dot HTML, uh, exclamation mark, tab, close that. Put in a script tag right here. And then in here, I'm just going to say int x, var x equals zero, and var sum equals zero. And then while sum is less than five, sum plus equals x, and x plus plus. And then at the bottom, we'll go ahead and alert x. Now, I'm not going to have any HTML here. I don't need it. Um, 
with this right here, it's not in a function. Notice up here, I don't say a function calculate or anything like that. Um, this code is gonna get executed on page load. So I'm gonna take that out, hit save, copy the path. And the only thing that we're gonna see is a little alert that shows what X is at the end of this thing. I'm gonna paste it here. This page says four. Okay, so this loop, uh, this code in here was executed four times. And then we alerted X, which was four at the very end of it. All right, let's keep going. Okay, a for loop. Now, don't get super intimidated by this. I know there's like lots of semicolons, but it's actually really nice, okay? So the for loop is a shorthand way of writing a counting while loop. Use a for loop when you need a simple counting loop. Now, with that said, 90% of the loops I use are probably for loops. I use them all the time. So uh, for var i equals one, while i is less than three, i plus plus. And then we alert i. So notice with our while loop, let me open that up here. There are a couple pieces to this while loop. Uh, even if I took this out, so um, even if I took out some, and if we just said x is less than five, and we took that out, um, that's what our first example looked like. Let me copy that real quick and paste it and I'll do that. We can have both of them in here. Okay, so with this first example, there are a few different things here. One, we have to declare X. Then we check a condition. And then at some point inside of the Y loop, we have to increment X. What would happen if I ran this code right here? Let's comment this out for now. What would happen if I ran this? Any thoughts? You would have infinite alerts. Yeah, yeah. And our, our computers aren't very are, aren't very good at handling infinite values. Okay, so this would alert until my browser crashes, pretty much, or until I give up on it. Um, but yeah, so I have nothing that's that's changing x. So every single time, it'd be like a zero less than five alert, a zero less than five alert. Okay, and so with a while loop, we have to put that in there, and sometimes people forget to put it in, and they end up with an infinite loop. And usually they can find it pretty quick because they're like, okay, my browser just crashed. Uh, I must have an infinite loop here somewhere. Um, with a for loop though, it's a lot easier to, to remember it because there are three parts to a for loop. If I forget one of these parts, I'm gonna get a big red error in my console and this code isn't even gonna run. So with a for loop, the declaration happens first. It says var i equals one. Then there's a condition. i is less than three. Is that true or not? If that is true, we'll enter, we'll do everything inside of the curly braces. And then after that, we'll go up here, increment i. And then once that's incremented, it'll check. Is i less than three? If it's true, it'll it'll run the code in here. And then it'll go back up, increment i, come back, check the Boolean expression. So it's basically doing the exact same thing as our counting while loop a second ago, but this is two lines of code. And our while loop was, um, let's see. One, two, three, four, five lines of code. Okay, I guess that's three if we include the curly brace at the end. All right, let's look at this other one. Uh, var i equals, we're getting a value from a user, uh, the input with an ID of start input box. We're parsing it to a whole number. And then right here, I didn't have to say var i equals something. I didn't have to declare i right here. Notice the semicolon though, we still have to have that. Anytime you have a for loop, you have to have those two semicolons. Usually you'll have a value in each, but sometimes if you already have I declared, you're not gonna redeclare it here. It doesn't, you, there's no point. So it's already declared. We have to put a semicolon there for this space. And then we have our Boolean expression and then how we're going to modify our loop once the statements are executed. Questions on this? So you, I have a quick question, Brother oh, Birch. Yeah, go ahead, Brian. Um, so, on W three schools, it doesn't include the for, in with the for loop. It doesn't include the var i equals, yeah. or or let i equals. Yeah. Um, it just there's nothing before the i. Um, what's the reasoning for that? Probably just laziness over many years of time. Um, but I uh, I very rarely use var inside of a for loop or let or const. Um, I usually just say, um, I'll usually just put i equals one 
or i equals zero or whatever uh, but you can put it a lot of people they have a different preference and they do put it uh, but even if you put it i guess some javascript linters a linter is just like something that checks for errors in a language some javascript linters will flag you for it and be like hey you have to declare this properly but a lot of them don't and so you're fine you're fine yeah i wasn't having issues with it until i did the quiz oh and interesting. it was it was hanging up on the quiz so that's why i was wondering if it was like absolutely necessary and that's why i was kept yeah. getting it wrong or if interesting that's a good question i'll have to look at the quiz to see what it's looking for there um but but yeah you don't need it so okay perfect okay. thank you yeah great question all right for each the for each loop causes the statements inside of it to be repeated once for each attribute in an object Use a for each loop when statements in the loop must be repeated once for each element in an object. This is really cool, you guys. I wonder if I have some code written here for this. Um, man, I don't. Okay, let me make a new file. And I'll say lecture for each document. .html. All right, exclamation mark, tab, close that, and make a script tag. And I'm just gonna kind of copy this. I'll say var text equals an empty string. And then I'll say for var part in document. Who knows what document is? Who knows what document is? You guys use it every week. I was like, isn't it just the, it's the, I don't even know how to say it. The file we are writing the HTML or the the coding? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, so so if I go back over here, uh, let's just look at my assignment from week seven. And I'll make this nice and big. Look at this guy, document. If I hit control D, it'll select the next time I have it in here. Okay, almost every single one of your HTML files this, this semester has had at least two lines of code with document in it. One for each input and one for the output. Okay, now notice here, when I have a date, I can run a get day function on it or a get week or, or, or get month or get time. Okay, so this date ends up being an object that has a lot of stuff in it, amongst which are a bunch of functions that you can use. The document object is huge. We use the get element by ID function all the time, but there's a lot of stuff in it. And we are gonna see what all is in there. So right here, I have a for each loop. Now, this for keyword looks exactly like the for keyword for a regular for loop. The only difference is the for loop looks like this, var i equals zero, i is less than 20, i plus plus, okay? In the parentheses for our for loop, I have two semicolons. I have three chunks of data in here. I have a declaration being made, I have a Boolean expression, and I have how my how I'm gonna prevent an infinite loop and how my loop's gonna change. Uh, but my, for my for each loop, um, the way that we would read this in English is for each part in document, okay? For this one, I would just say for i equals zero while i is less than 20 increment i, okay? So really the only difference between these two is uh, this one has a part in document or a, I could name this anything, I could say student in class or anything. Um, and, uh, and this one has the, the three chunks, the, 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 two, the two semicolons. So let's, let's take that out of here. Now document is a reserved keyword in JavaScript. It'll recognize it. Um, you know, if I look at this, it'll, it, it recognizes what document is. Same way that it recognizes the for statement or if I said function, it, it recognizes those as keywords. So right here, we're gonna loop through every single item in the document object in JavaScript. And for each one, we're gonna, we're gonna give it a variable name called part. And then every time we come back up here to this part of our loop, um, the next item in the document will get, we'll assign that to the variable part and we'll just redeclare part every single time. Meanwhile, we have var text as an empty string and we'll just add part to that every single time. Now, in JavaScript, in a lot of different languages, data, are, data is stored in, in what we call key value pairs. And so uh, let's say I was gonna look up a student. Um, 
there, there might be a lot of students with the last name of Jones or Anderson. And so I probably won't look up a student by their name or I could try, but it might not be the most efficient way to do it. Uh, the most effective way to do it would probably be to look them up by their I number if I had it, because their I number will uniquely identify a student. All right, so if I had, you know, the I number as like the key of a student, and then I have data for the value. Okay, so right here, um, if we look at our assignment from last week, dot value is the key for this input box. All right, it's how I find data, but the data is the value. Okay, so we have our key right here. I'm gonna say, hey, give me the value of what's ever in this value key, All right? Or right here, I have the inner HTML, that's the name of our key. And then we're going to assign a value to that key. So if I look back at here, we're saying, all right, here's the name of each item in the document. Maybe it's a function called get element by ID. That would be the name of the key. And then the value would be whatever data is stored there. So right here, I'm able to isolate the name and the value by doing this. And I'll add all of this to our text string with a nice HTML break there. Uh, after this whole thing is done, I'll just say document dot get element by ID and I'll say output dot inner HTML equals text. And then right here, I'll say, uh, we'll, have it, we'll add a div with an ID of output. Okay, let's try this, let's see what happens. Copy path, new tab, paste it. Got an error, let's see what our error is. Okay. Output, output, that's interesting. Oh, okay, so this is, this is an interesting error that we don't come across very much in this class. It's saying, that it cannot set the property of inner HTML of null. But line 17 says I have an ID called output. Any thoughts on why this is happening? Where are we getting the information from? Like, is there information going into it right now? Is that there isn't. Problem? No, because document is, is an object that's built in the JavaScript. Yeah. And so that's, that's where all the data is. That's what we're going to loop through is that object that's in JavaScript. Yeah. yeah. So. So this happens because this ran faster than this did. Okay. When my browser reads this file, it'll just start at the top and it'll, it'll execute this JavaScript. And when it executed this, it still had not rendered this div. Now, the reason why I said we don't get that issue very much in this class is because we always call our functions with buttons. So I can say on click, um, print document. And then in here, I'll put all this inside of a function called print document. Okay, now if I put all this in here, and I refresh the page, you can see none of this code has run yet. And so it was able to render my page as fast as it is. Um, it, was it was able to render my page. And if I hit this button, it'll go ahead and, and do this code. So look at this, here's our, here's our document object in JavaScript. Okay, here's every single key with all of their values. It's a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff. Uh, if I looked here, we could probably find um, a get element by ID function somewhere in here. Oh, right there, get element by ID. There's our function that we always use. Okay, but there's a lot of stuff in here, a lot of stuff that's built in to this document object in JavaScript. Now I can see that if I put a breakpoint right here and I hit our button again, I can hover over document and I can see what it is. Okay, I can see every single key and every single value. And there's a lot of like nested objects in here and I can look through all of it. And what we did right here, when we said for each item inside of document, go ahead and print the item name and the value for that item. And this is what we got, this massive thing. So loops are extremely powerful. For each loops are extremely powerful too. Okay, we're not gonna go too much into objects or arrays in this class, but they are super, super common. You've used objects every single week. 
you use the date object this last week, you're continue to use them while you code in JavaScript or any language. And um, the ability to loop through anything is really powerful. So, okay, any questions about this example? Just so I'm understanding it correctly, we had learned about the four loops and they have the three parts. Mm -hmm. But this one, we're getting around that because we're using, like, we're getting an element that, like, like we're getting box. Um, we're using the special term for that, like, in document. And then we use yes. same variable. Yep. For each loop, the main keyword here is in. It will always yeah. have in some data structure. Okay. In this case, our document object, it could be an array, um, but we'll always have in something. For in something. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank oh. you. Yeah. Great question. All right. Okay. Uh, let's keep going. Okay. Uh, do while the only post test loop in JavaScript is the do while loop. When to use when you can't count and must use a sentinel controlled loop and the loop statements must be executed before checking the sentinel. So uh, what this means is the do while loop, this code right here, these two lines of code where we assign alias and response different values will be a, will always run at least once, no matter what is in the loop condition. Then it will check and say, hey, while the response is not equal to yes, we'll go back and we'll repeat everything inside of our do part of our loop. Pretty simple, just like a while loop. The only difference is Instead of having our braces, our curly braces after the while Boolean condition, we have them before and we call it a do while loop. So in this case, it says uh, alias is equal to, when we prompt the user, we say, what's your name? And then uh, we say, are you sure that James is your name? If they respond yes, then we alert, hello, James. If they respond anything but yes, then we'll go back and say, okay, what's your name? And they'll enter their name and, and it'll, just keep, it'll just keep going. So with this example, we'd want to run this at least once. Otherwise, we won't know their name and we won't know if it's accurate. So we, we run it once, we get their name, and it'll just keep on going while, while, it's, while it is inaccurate. So very good example of a sentinel controlled loop. It's not counted. We have no idea how many times the user is going to run this. It could be anything. OK, different kinds of loops. So we have uh, zero-based counting. If I look over here. For each one of these screenshots, I wrote it with a while loop and a for loop for every single one. And each one does the exact same thing. So this while loop does the exact same thing as this for loop. And you can kind of compare how they were both written and how much you like either one of them. So for the while loop here, I declared n equals three, i equals one, while i is less than n, we'll alert leaf and we'll increment i. So this would run uh, while i is equal to zero, one, and two. So it would run three times. Uh, right here, var n equals three, uh, four, i equals zero, while i is less, less than n, we'll increment i. Okay, so it'll still run just three times and for every single time that it'll run, it'll, it'll alert leaf. Uh, skipping loops, var skip equals two, n equals 12, i equals zero, while i is less than n. So while zero is less than 12, we'll alert stem and i plus equals skip. So right here, when we're, when we're incrementing i, Instead of saying, we'll add one to i, this time we're gonna add two to i. So if I had to count how many times this would happen, uh, while well, i is less than n, so it'd be zero, while well, i is equal to zero, two, four, six, eight, ten. 10. It would enter, it would alert stem six times, and then it would alert or it would increment i by two, i would be equal to 12, and then it would jump out of our loop because 12 is not less than 12. And then here's the exact same way that I would write it with a for loop. Uh, an infinite loop, okay? This is something that you never want to write, but here are some examples of how you could write them. Uh, var i equals zero, while i is less than five, alert hello. That's all you gotta do. Just leave out something that increments i, and that'll give you an infinite loop. Something that is common is if you're saying, while well, i is greater than 10, uh, which sometimes you do, you know, instead of saying, while well, i is less than 10. Um, but we get so used to saying like i plus plus with loops, if you say, well, I is greater than 10 and I starts off at 15 and you say I plus plus, then I'll go from 15 to 16 to 17 to 18 and it'll never be less than 10. So that would be an infinite loop as well, even though you're changing I. Uh, the for loop, again, it's harder to do it with the for loop because 
this empty space right there is always like a, a massive red flag. It's like, hey, you're missing a part of your loop here. Okay. Uh, but this is syntactically correct. You could run this code and it wouldn't give you an error in your console. Uh, it'll just run forever and make something crash on your computer. So, so like you said, it, it will run, it will compile. Um, so if we're doing something that we, we want to like grab an array, we would want to like use more, we're just trying to like, because I know we can leave the first space blank, but we need to have something in the second, and I guess we can leave the third one blank, the third space blank. What what things can we put in the third space besides the plus plus and minus minus? Can we, can we do like, like uh, calculations in there or is that kind of like frowned upon? Yeah, so technically you can put anything there. You know, if you wanted to increment a different variable, you could. A lot of the time you'll have like a sentinel controlled type loop and you might increment something that isn't what's in the Boolean expression. That's a lot less common though. Usually with something like that, you'll see it in a while loop, uh, but you could do it if you wanted to. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, getting out of a loop. So here's a code example that reads 10 or fewer numbers from the user and computes and outputs the sum. The code stops reading numbers from the user after 10 numbers or after the user enters zero, whichever comes first. Let's see how they do that. Okay, I have a function called sum 10, assuming that we'll call this function somewhere. Var sum equals zero. For i equals zero, while i is less than 10, we'll increment i. So we're gonna have a prompt, we'll prompt the user for a number, we will parse it into a floating point number. Okay, so it can have a decimal. Uh, we'll assign that to n. And we say, if n is equal to zero, break. So if the user types in zero, this Boolean expression will be true. We'll go into here. And break is the keyword or statement that will get us out of loop no matter what. So it doesn't matter if this is the first time it's running or the sixth time that it's running. Uh, if the user enters zero and it hits this line of code, it'll jump out of the loop. And you can do this with any type of loop. You can use break to get out of it. Otherwise, we'll go ahead and say sum we'll add n onto the, onto the value of sum. Okay, questions on this one, you guys? Okay. All right, use cases and examples. Let's see here. Uh, compound interest, that's a good one. Uh, determine if a number is prime and creating repetitive strings or other variables. Let's look at a couple of these. Uh, compound interest, whoops. So, um, our HTML, we have uh, input for balance, an annual growth rate, and number of months. So let's say I gave like $1,000 to my bank, and the annual growth rate was like 5%, and I'm going to keep it there for 10 years. Okay, let's actually, let's run this real quick, and then we can walk through the code. Okay, so we have a balance of, let's give our bank 1000 bucks. Growth rate is 5%. Number of months is 120. Then it says your balance after 120 months will be $1,647.01. Now let's look at how we did that. So uh, once we put in these three numbers, we'll call the future value function. And then we'll have an output div where that value is outputted. So we come up here to future value. And oh, that's, I don't like that. Hang on one second. Okay, here's our inputs all of them parsed so that we have numbers that we can do math and comparisons with. And then we had our annual rate, which was 0 0.05. So we will compute our monthly rate, which will divide that 0 0.05 by 12, because that will be the, the amount that it goes up every single month. And then for each month, compute the interest and add it to the balance. So we say month equals one, while month is less than or equal to number of months, whatever the user put in then we'll increment month. In here, we said interest equals balance times monthly rate. So I don't know what 0.5 is times 12 or divided by 12. Oops, divided by 12. Uh, 0 0.004167. Um, so we'd multiply that by the balance of 1,000 for this first time looping through and we'd add that, we'd make that our interest. So if we multiplied that by 1,000, looks like we'd add four bucks onto it for our first month. Then we add that $4 onto our balance. 
and there's our closing curly brace. We go back up here and we say, is month less than or equal to months? Okay, well, we just increment a month. So it went from one to two. Two is still less than 120. And so now we'll say 1004 times 0 0.004 or whatever it was. And you can see here, we have a nice function for compound interest. At the very end of that, we'll go ahead and round this to two decimal places. And then we'll output that. And it says your balance after, put the number of months in there that they put in. Uh, so 120 months will be dollar sign and then we'll have balance. Okay, questions on this, you guys? Pretty cool, right? Loops are incredible. Okay, let's look at another one. Um, prime slow. So input, we have an integer. Output is, is the number prime or not prime. And then the process, uh, determine if they give a number. Wow, that's a really useless processing. Uh, determine if the given integer is prime or not. So down here, please enter an integer. And then we'll call the isPrime function. And then we'll have an output div. In here, candidate, we're parsing as a whole number, whatever the user types in. Uh, number of times looped, uh, I don't think we actually need that. Uh, we'll, we'll leave it for now. Uh, factor count equals zero, count the number of factors that evenly divide candidate. So for divisor equals one, well, divisor is less than or equal to candidate. Okay, divisor is one. Let's say we put in like 37. Uh, let me copy this path. Let's run it real quick like we did our last one. So I'm going to put in 37, hit our button. It says number of times looped is 37. Factor count is two. Okay, so that was, that's why that was in there. And then it says 37 is prime. So let's look here. And so right here, it says var remainder equals candidate modulus divisor. So if our candidate is 37 and our divisor is one, Okay, if I say 37 modulus one, what would that return? You're on mute, Samuel. 37? Uh, it'd be zero. Zero, but like, like 37 divided by one is 37. Right? Yeah, so, so we, could, we could check this. If I come in here and I say 37 divided by one, 37. 37 modulus one, remember it gets us zero. the remainder. So one goes into 37 evenly, 37 times, which we don't care about with modulus. We just know that it's zero. So right here, um, anytime there's a remainder here that's greater than zero, we'll add our factor count, okay? So in this case, that was one. And so we would add one onto here. And then we'd keep on looping through. And then once we hit 37, okay, while well, divisor is less than or equal to candidate, uh, 37 is equal to 37. And 37 modulus 37 is one. Well, let's see what that is actually. 37 modulus 37, oh, it would be zero, okay? Um, if remainder is zero, we'll add our factor count. And then down here, if factor count is equal to two, then we'll output candidate is prime. Otherwise, we'll output candidate is not prime. And so let's put in a breakpoint here, right inside of our function. And I'm gonna put in four. I, well, let's put in, but yeah, let's do four. Okay, and I'll hit our button. Pull this up a little bit. Okay, candidate is four, number of times looped is zero. Factor count is zero currently. Uh, divisor, we just assigned that. Notice how it went to this step in my for loop. Okay, first it assigned this variable. So divisor is one. And now it's showing this extra dark purple or blue to show that this is where we're at. So I can say is divisor less than candidate or equal to candidate? Yes. So we come down in here, number of times looped, we're at one, and then candidate modulus divisor. So we have one or four modulus one. I can look at this and see that it'll be zero. Okay, if remainder is zero, then factor count plus plus because one is a factor of four. Okay, let's go through again. Now you can see this dark blue is right here. Okay, divisor just went up to two, still less than or equal to candidate. Number of times loop got in incremented. And now it says is four modulus two, is equal to zero because two goes into four. Factor count is now up to two. Okay, increment divisor, divisor up to three. Uh, three is less than or equal to four. And then we say is four modulus three, it's equal to one. So this time three is not a factor of four. We don't add it to, to the factor count. Okay, divisor gets bumped up to four, which is still less than or equal to four. 
Then we say is four modulus four, zero, remainder is equal to zero. We increase our factor count because four is a factor of four. Okay, now if we look at our factor count, it's three. Uh, we jump out of our for loop because five is greater than candidate. And it says, uh, if factor is equal to two. Okay. It says that four is not prime. Okay. Because if factor count is equal to two, then it, it means it's prime because there's only two numbers that are divisible by it. So if I took 17, it's only divisible by one in 17, which means it's prime. Okay, if I have a composite number like four or 12 or six or 30, all of them are multiplied or multiple are have multiples in that have more than two multiples. Okay, so let's do one more. Let's put in a five right here. I say is prime and uh, we come through here and this first remainder is zero because the divisor was one. So five modulus one is zero. Increase our factor count. Now our divisor is up to two. Okay. Uh, remainder is one, five modulus two leaves one. So that's false, no more factors there. Two is not a factor of five. Divisor is three, okay. Two is left over, five modulus three leaves two. So that's false again. Coming in here, divisor is four, remainder is remain, one. Four goes into five once with one left over. We come back over here, divisor is now five, remainder is zero, five modulus five is zero. We increase our factor count and we jump down here. Factor count is equal to two, which means five is a prime number, okay? Now, this right here, the number of times looped is here to, for us to see the speed that this executes. So let's put in a big number. So I'll say like 1 million, I don't know if this will be prime or not, probably not. We're not gonna step through this whole thing, you guys don't worry. Uh, so we looped. Uh, 1,456,987 times that fast. And the factor count is four, look at that. So it's a composite, okay? One and our big number were multiples. And apparently there are two more in there, okay? But it had a factor count of four. So that's not a prime number. Let's try nine, let's see what we get. Uh, we looped through that many times. The factor count is eight this time, interesting. Uh, let's try seven, seven, see if we get anything there. Factor count is eight again. Now, if we wanted to, we could even print out these factors, okay? Right here where we're saying factor count, instead of just incrementing fact, factor count, I could, I could declare a message right here and I could say var factors, make it an empty string. And then right here, I could say factors plus equals, uh, it'd be divisor. And then we'll add just a break and we can see what all of them are. And then down here, Let's just make another output. I'll say document dot get element by ID. Uh, output two inner HTML equals factors. I just have to add another ID down here. So would we would we have to output number before or after an increment? Well, let's look at it. Um, I think we would like to see what the factors are. Yeah. So where we start a divisor at one and we're saying, well, divisor is less than or equal to the candidate, we would do it while it's here. Wow. Uh, wow. Yeah. Okay. If I said divisor is equal to zero while divisor is less than candidate, that would work. Um, but then I'd have to add one here to actually see the, the factors. Okay. So if I run this, let's put our big number here, uh, 1 million. That's one of our numbers. Uh, factor count is two. Wow, we found a prime. Okay. This one's prime and then here are two factors. Okay, let's try another one. Let's do 90 and says factor count is eight. We looped uh, one and a half million times and here are our eight numbers. Pretty powerful, right? That's pretty cool. That's really cool to see. So um, th there, there are so many things that you can do with loops, it's crazy. Now notice with this, um, the, the number that I put here is the number of times that we looped through this which is fine, it's working. Um, if I put in like a really big number, uh, let's try like a billion. Okay, notice it's it's taken a sec, I just clicked on it. All right, because it's looping through this a billion times. So I looped through this a billion times and I found 32 different factors and there they are. Okay, so definitely not prime. Uh, but the bigger this number gets, the longer it's gonna take. That was still really fast to go through a billion loops, but not as fast as I would like. 
So uh, let's look at another example real quick of how we could make this faster. Uh, right here, uh, candidate, this is the same limit. This is new. Okay, let's say the user put in like, um, what's a square number? 81. Okay, 80, the square root of 81 is nine, right? So if I put in 81, uh, the square root of that would be nine, and that is my limit. Notice for my loop, I say divisor equals two, not one, we don't have to know if it's one, okay? While divisor is less than or equal to nine, even though I put in 81, uh, we'll increment divisor by one. And then here we say if candidate modulus divisor, and if the remainder is zero, then we'll say prime is false. Otherwise, uh, prime was declared as true. So this time it wouldn't find two factors, okay? Uh, it wouldn't find one and one billion, whatever my two numbers are. It'll just check uh, for those few in between um, up to that square root, that square rooted value. So if I look at this, let me copy this number. We had one billion and it took a couple seconds to run it. Um, I'll have to recopy that. Okay, copying that. Here's our, our, our fast one. I'll put this in here. It says number of times looped one. And it says that that is prime, which I don't think is accurate, right? Which said that that wasn't prime. That's weird. What's going on with our program here? Huh. I'll look into this and I'll see why that's not working. But anyways, but by doing this, um, we can reduce this by one just by starting at two. And then right here, if anything within its square root is, is divisible by a number in there, then we know that it's that it's not a prime number. So, okay, any questions on, any, on either one of these examples? Okay, then let's look at one more. Uh, we have a function here called build string. Uh, let's go ahead and run this in our browser. Let's see what it's doing. Okay, this program will take, will accept a number from the user and from zero to that number and save it in a string. So let's put in a number, I'll say five, and you can see zero, one, two, three, four, five, and we'll put in our one billion number. Whoops, that's more than a billion. Uh, run function. I shouldn't have done it, such a big number. Anyways, it'll make a nice comment to the limited list and it'll put it on the page. Uh, the last time that we did this, uh, it took a couple seconds, but not this long because it had to loop that many times, but that was it. And then it just alerted one value at the very end. This has taken a long time because in addition to looping that many times, think about how much data is gonna have to be used to store a string that big in my computer. Cause we'll have every single number up to like 1 billion. What is this anyways? Uh, one, two, three, yeah. So this is, yeah, this is a billion, okay. <laughs> Um, but it's taken that long because it's trying to store all of this in memory and it'll be all inside of one, one string. So almost like an infinite loop, not quite. Um, oh good, I'm glad I was able to close that. Sometimes when you get a loop going like that, your browser doesn't want to close. So let's just say 1 million and we'll run this. It should be significantly faster. Okay, there's our number or there's, there's our string. Okay, now we can see how big a million looks. All right, and you can see we ended at a million. So this is just a, a classic example of string concatenation with a, with a large loop, but we could do all sorts of stuff with this. Okay, let's look at our code. Uh, user integer, parse float from user value, repetitive string, we started off at zero. Uh, I equals one, while I is less than or equal to one million. Um, if I is not equal to zero, then we'll just say, we'll add a comma under our zero and a space and we'll say plus I and I plus plus, and we'll output our repetitive stream. Questions on this one? Okay, all right. Let's see what else we got going here today. Oh, common mistakes, this is important. So uh, writing infinite loops, we already talked about here in the top left corner, uh, incorrect, while I is less than three, alert hello, we have nothing to increment I which means it will run infinite times because zero will always be less than three. Writing loop that never repeats, this is common too. So a for loop I equals zero while I is greater than three. That'll never happen, which means I will never increment because zero is not greater than three. So this won't even execute once, which means I will never increment. Uh, using commas instead of semicolons. 
So right here, if you run this, you'll see this error really fast. Um, it'll show up nice and bright for you in the console. This one right here won't show up for you in the console. It's not a syntax error, it is a logical error. No one wants a loop that never loops. It's a logical error. This, however, using commas instead of semicolons, that is a syntax error, and it'll give you a nice big red error in the console. You gotta use semicolons. Uh, for getting braces, okay, so this example in the bottom left corner, uh, everything looks great, except it doesn't have curly braces. You need to have curly braces here for your code, for your loops. Uh, placing semicolons after the parentheses of loops. Um, so, wow, this kind of reminds me of CS124, Samuel. Um, so right here, if, if I put a semicolon right here, then this code will never get executed ever. So again, it's not really a syntax error. This would still run in my browser. It just make it that so that I, I don't even need a loop, you know? Uh, it would go through this and it would say I equals zero while I is less than three. Uh, that'd be true, but there's a semicolon right here. Whoops. So it would go ahead and increment I and then check. Increment I and check. Increment I, it would never run the code inside of here. Okay, so I might as well just declare I at two instead of zero. Um, so yeah, don't put semicolons after your Boolean expressions or, or your for loops. Okay, and use the developer tools. So it's really nice when you have an error come up uh, that you can just see it in bright red here in the developer tools in the console. Um, otherwise, if you're having issues here, put a breakpoint in. Okay, I can put a breakpoint in right here. Let, let me make this a smaller number. We'll say 150. Um, I can put a breakpoint in here and see exactly where the code stops doing what I want it to do. All right, I can see, okay, user integer is good. My string looks good so far. Is I less than or equal to user integer? Yes. And I can just step through as many times as I need to, uh, to see where an error is taking place. So please, please, please use the developer tools, leave them open while you're running your code. So, all right, any, any other questions you guys? I have a question that's not about this though. Oh, <laughs> I yeah, good. Because I just wanted to make sure I understand correctly. Is next week the same chapter, but we're just doing harder coding, like more difficult. Yeah. So we don't have to, we don't have all the reading in the, um, but then there's an exam, right? A big old, huge, giant yes. test. Yeah. So if you look at my plan for our lecture next week, um, in addition to exam preparation stuff, uh, really, we're just going to go through the different programs at the end of your book. We're going to write as many of them as we can together, um, which will really help you as you get ready for your test. Because your test will be really similar to last week, where you'll have like multiple choice type questions, and then you write some code at the end of it. Um, so yeah, you don't have a chapter to read next week. Uh, next week for our lecture, we'll just write all these programs. This multiple, these multiplication ones are really cool. I'm excited to write them with you. Um, but yeah, that's what we're doing next week. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Three exams total or more? Three exams. Okay. Yeah. Weeks five, nine, 13, 14, 14. Okay. I have a question regarding the assignment this week, if you have time. Yeah. Let me, I have a class of 10 minutes. So I got 10 minutes. Shoot away. Okay. This, if, if it's can't be answered today, that's fine. Okay. Um, if I wanted to display in my output, the equation, yeah. so the, all the odd numbers plus equals that kind of thing. Is there a way to do that? Yes, there is. If you look at, where was that? Where did we do that? I, I was it the, um, yeah, that. Right here. So you do something really similar to this. That's what uh, I was wondering. Yeah, but you could print up anything, you know, if I had, um, you know, if, if I wanted to get, in this case, I wanted a list of all my divisors and I put a break between each. I could very easily uh, put a, a comma and a space between each. I could put anything between each. Um, but if I was gonna like loop through something and uh, let's just make a new file real quick, actually. And I'll say temp looping.html, exclamation mark tab. We'll put a script tag in here. And let's say I had four i equals zero, well, i is less than 100, i plus plus. Um, and if I say, if I was gonna add up like all the even numbers, 
um, I could say var sum equals zero. And if I modulus Well, let's see here. I guess I'd say 100 modulus i, if this is like the number that the user gave us. So if 100 modulus i is equal to zero, then right here I'd say sum plus equals i, which would take care of my sum. But then if I also had like a string that I wanted to build, I could say var um, all evens, started off as an empty string. And then right here, I would just say all evens plus equals I, and then maybe like a space or a comma in a space or something like that. Does that answer your question? Yes, I okay. will test that out. Thank okay. you. Have fun. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions, you guys? Okay. Thanks for going over this, it's a lot easier. Um, like. <laughs> hearing you talk about it than just reading. So thank you. You're very welcome. It's good to have you guys here. So if, if you need any help this week, don't hesitate to ask. Thank you. Hey, yeah. See you guys later. Thank you. Oh. Yeah.